Hard to believe this is uh, the last weekly program in January, and we'll be at a new month uh, next month, uh, next week, and uh, a little bit closer to spring, which, which feels good. No lack of developments uh, over the past week, uh, and frankly, within the past couple of days uh, to report on. Uh, I intend to cover those issues, uh, both with some uh, preliminary talk about uh, the current COVID trends, and then at the end, uh, to bookend the program with some um, notable developments, uh, including some discussion about recent litigation and a ruling impacting New York's uh, so-called mask mandate. So again, I'll cover that uh, in more detail at the end of the program. In between, we're gonna have two excellent presentations on relevant topics for you uh, and for your operations here in New York. So let's talk a little bit initially about some of the trends that we're seeing uh, with respect to COVID. And uh, as before, I've pulled uh, data and taken a look at data from the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Center, which is a, a good authoritative uh, resource and a good one to keep tabs on. Um, you know, again, I, I there's really a tremendous amount of information out there. I continue to be a, um, you know amazed at that when I when I really dig through it and. You know, not all of it necessarily trickles out through our, our various media sources, but um, let's cover a, a few of the same areas that I've covered in the past. Uh, and again, we see what uh, I think can be fairly described as uh, more positive trends uh, across the board. So the first chart on top you see is the, the number of daily cases uh, and a graphing of the seven day average. And of course we saw a very dramatic spike uh, in the number of daily cases and average cases earlier this month. Just for example, on January 3rd, uh, that day we had in New York over 132,000 positive cases. Uh, and if you look at the, the peak uh, of this first chart to the far right, um, we had it on that day, uh, 85, over 85,000 uh, uh, cases as a seven day average. And on that particular day, there were 78,000 cases. So again, that was really the peak, 85,000 uh, cases on the seven day average. Fast forward to just to yesterday, again, you see this very dramatic decline, uh, which is good news, which follows, I think, the experiences of other countries uh, who have generally trended ahead of us on this. And you see a very dramatic drop. Um, as of yesterday, there were just 12, over 12,000 cases uh, in the day uh, and the seven day, seven day average had dropped to 22,000, just over 22,000 uh, from that 85 figure just a, a matter of days ago. So again, positive developments there. Uh, likewise, we see this trend um, reflected in the number of daily deaths uh, here in New York due to COVID. Just to give you a frame of reference, the very dramatic spike that you see back from April uh, of 2020, uh, is notable to give you a, a sense of the metrics there. Uh, on April 9th of 2020, on that particular day, there were there were over a thousand deaths, a thousand fifty-two deaths, as a matter of fact. And the seven-day average for daily deaths was uh, over a thousand, a thousand and fourteen. Fast forward now to um, the 24th uh, yesterday, and the data available then. Of course, you see the decline. Um, and the trend there, um, typically the, the, the daily deaths is a lagging indicator as, as reflected and compared with the number of daily cases, but we see a downward trend beginning to um, uh, announce itself there. Uh, and if you compare where we are now with where we were back in April of 2020, of course, there's a stark contrast there. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, there were 106 deaths reported in New York and the seven day average was 162. So I think those are, again, positive trends certainly stand in stark contrast with what we were experiencing before in the pandemic. On the next slide, you'll see a, a couple of additional graphs that I think are notable. Again, both reflect the positive trends that we're seeing here in New York and across the country. Uh, with respect to hospitalizations, uh, we saw our, uh, the peak that you see to the far right in January on the top graph, uh, the the, the the really peak of that was on the 11th of January. Uh, on that date, there were over 13,000 uh, instances of hospitalization, and the seven-day average was, uh, again, also over 13,000. 
13,166 was the seven day daily average for hospitalizations uh, related to COVID. Uh, and in the decline, again, just, just a matter of uh, days later on the 24th, uh, we had uh, over 10,000 uh, daily hospitalizations, so that number down from 13,000. And the seven day average had also declined from over 13,000 to just over 11,000, so good trends. Finally, on the, on the positivity uh, rate, uh, again, this is something that I try to keep tabs on, I, I think a helpful indicator. Uh, and once again, if we go back and look at uh, the peak to the far left uh, of the chart back in April of 2020, uh, if you go back to the 5th of April 2020, on that date, there were over 18,000 positive tests. And perhaps even more incredibly, um, the rate of positivity was 48%. Now, fast forward uh, to more recently on the 7th of January, where you see to the far right of the graph, that's really the, the peak that we saw there in early January. Uh, on that date, there were over 377,000 positive tests with a positivity rate of 22%. Since that date, uh, and as of yesterday, that has declined. There were, as opposed to the 377,000 on the 24th, there were only 143,000. Uh, positive tests, and that positivity rate had declined to 10%. So again, a uh, good improvement there on, on all fronts. Uh, hopefully this trend continues, and hopefully Omicron's is the last uh, new name that we need to learn when it comes to variants. Time will tell, I suppose, on that. Uh, so beyond those metrics in terms of the trends, uh, you know, the other, I think, key piece of this from a, a public policy standpoint and a factor that we see uh, elected officials uh, take into consideration is the impact of COVID on hospitalizations and staffing and hospitalizations. And uh, the next slide, uh, the next two slides, you'll see some data that, uh, again, I pulled from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, in their center, uh, focused on New York hospitalizations. Uh, and in there, uh, I think overall, the, 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 you know, the trends are what you would expect based on what we've seen in, on the other uh, metrics. Um, but there, there is still a, a cushion, so to speak, with respect to beds. Now, this chart is just uh, dealing with uh, general inpatient beds, uh, not specialized care, but general inpatient beds. Uh, you see uh, on the chart in January 22, an increased allotment of those beds are being used for COVID inpatients. Uh, and uh, as of um, the week of the 24th starting, uh, you see the figures on the top right-hand corner, just to give you a sense of things. But uh, at this point, there is a good number of unoccupied inpatient beds uh, across the state as a whole. Of course, this may vary depending on the jurisdiction and, and the geographic area and the resources available in those areas, but uh, at least there is, there is a cushion to report. On the next slide, you'll see some discussion about ICU beds in particular. Uh, and once again, if you head to the far right of the chart, you see that there is more, you know, there's been greater incidence and in use of uh, those ICU beds since the start of uh, January and the emergence of Omicron, uh, but still here there is a, uh, a cushion. Uh, the top gray is essentially the cushion that you see there. And so uh, currently we have, let's say, uh, over 1,500 ICU beds occupied with COVID uh, issues, uh, but there still remains uh, an additional 841 that are available um, across New York according to the Hopkins study. So again, uh, certainly things to keep tab on certainly things to be concerned about, but hopefully we're seeing progress in these areas. Okay, so, so that's some of the, the nuts and bolts on what we're seeing with the trends. Again, I'm gonna cover some additional COVID related issues at the end of the program. But before I, I do that, I wanna turn it over to two guests that we have today. Uh, first will be DJ Nugent. I have the pleasure of, of working with DJ on a wide variety of issues. He's an associate uh, here in our Syracuse office and focuses on employee benefits and related issues. And I, for one, am grateful uh, to have somebody like DJ on our staff. So when an ERISA issue does come up, I don't have to dig into ERISA and then I can call DJ instead. Um, uh, in the course of his practice, uh, DJ is focused on a number of COVID related issues. And today he's here to report on a development that dealt with, in particular, uh, the coverage of uh, over the counter COVID testing on group health plans. Uh, something that I know we've received a number of questions about, and I suspect you're interested on too. So DJ, thanks for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Andy. So like Andy said, I'm going to present on 
a new piece of guidance that was issued earlier this month that talks about insurance coverage for at-home COVID testing. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. Just to lay the legal framework before we get into the most re recent guidance that was issued, back in 2020, March 18th of 2020, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was signed by then President Trump, and I'll call that the FFCRA for this presentation. Section 6001 of the FFCRA generally requires group health plans and health insurance issuers to provide benefits for certain items and services related to COVID-19 testing without imposing any cost sharing. So essentially what this section of the FFCRA says is that COVID-19 tests need to be covered by health insurance, either self-funded plans or fully insured plans without imposing any deductibles or co-payments. The CARES Act that was issued soon thereafter, the FFCRA expanded and amended the FFCRA slightly. Um, section 3201 of the CARES Act amended Section 6001 of the FFCRA to include a, a broader range of tests and items and services that would need to be covered by plans and issuers without any cost sharing. And it also had another section, Section 3202, um, that relates to some, some cost of the testing, how plans and um, issuers would be required to pay for those COVID-19 tests. Fast forward from the FFCRA in the CARES Act to June of 2020, when we got some FAQ guidance from the joint agencies, the DOL, HHS, and the Department of Treasury. And what the June 2020 guidance said is that plans and issuers are required under FFCRA Section 6001 to cover COVID-19 tests intended for at-home testing when the test is ordered by an attending healthcare provider who has determined that the test is medically appropriate. So essentially, the, the June 2020 guidance said, yes, Section 6001 of the FFCRA would apply to at-home COVID tests. Therefore, at-home COVID tests would need to be covered without any cost sharing. However, that no cost sharing requirement would only apply to at-home COVID tests that were ordered by your, your doctor or some other healthcare provider. And the, the rationale behind that June 2020 rule was there was really not widespread at-home COVID testing at the time. And the other issue was at the time, the, the at-home COVID testing that was available, there was concerns that people would not be able to read and interpret their test results at home. So there really wasn't a framework existing at that time for the coverage without cost sharing of at-home COVID tests to be put forth. That June 2020 FAQ guidance also had some helpful information for employers that said COVID-19 testing for employment-related purposes, so this would be weekly testing or return-to-work tests, do not need to be covered under FFCRA Section 6001. And that, that's a question we've got um, several times is if I have to test to return to work or as part of a weekly testing, will insurance cover that test? The answer to that question is insurance does not have to cover those tests. So that brings us up to the most recent piece of guidance that was issued in January of this year. And if Kathy, you can flip to the next slide, please. So on January 10th of this year, we got additional FAQ guidance issued by the same joint agencies, DOL, HHS, and Treasury. And what this guidance said is how plans and issuers are required to cover and reimburse enrollees for at-home COVID-19 tests. This guidance took effect January 15th of this year, and it's going to last through the end of the public health emergency, which is still ongoing. What this January 10 FAQ guidance said is that health plans and issuers need to cover at-home COVID-19 tests with or without an order or individualized clinical assessment by a healthcare provider. So up until this year, plans and issuers did not have to cover at-home COVID tests without cost sharing if a doctor had not ordered that at-home COVID test. That rule has now changed. Plans and issuers are going to be required to cover at-home COVID tests regardless of whether a doctor has ordered that at-home COVID test or not. Additionally, what this guidance says is that enrollees can seek reimbursement regardless of where they purchase the test. So if they purchase a test at their in-network pharmacy, that would be covered without cost sharing. They can also go on the internet, Amazon, other online resources, purchase those tests and submit reimbursement to their insurer. Those need to be covered without any cost sharing as well. And now the agencies understand that this system of having people go to Amazon, purchase tests, which may be artificially inflated in cost, 
is not necessarily the best system. It's time consuming. It takes time for people to get reimbursed from their health plans um, and health insurers. There's a safe harbor that's created under this January 10 FAQ. And what the safe harbor allows is plans and issuers to set up what they call a direct coverage option. Under the direct coverage option, in-network pharmacies and other retailers would have at-home COVID tests for people to come get, and it would be free to people when they come in, regardless of whether they have an order from their doctor or not. Um, now, if you adopt that safe harbor, there are some benefits to setting up this type of system. Reimbursement can be limited to $12 per test or the actual price of the test, whichever is lower if individuals purchase COVID tests from non-network retailers. So individuals have the option to go to their in-network pharmacy and get an at-home COVID test, or they can go on Amazon and get an at-home COVID test. But if they go on Amazon, their reimbursement can be limited to $12 per test. If the safe harbor is not utilized, plans and issuers cannot set a limit on the amount of the reimbursement amount. So you're, you would be required to reimburse whatever that person spent on Amazon if you do not adopt the safe harbor. Additionally, if you adopt the safe harbor, plans and issuers can limit coverage to eight tests per person per 30 day period. So just another benefit to going through those steps to set up the direct coverage option. You could limit the price that you provide for reimbursement and you can also limit the amount of tests that you're providing reimbursement for. Now the January 10th FAQs also understand that health insurance plans and issuers may be interested in, in preventing fraud and abuse. That's something that they may be concerned about with this reimbursement of you know, getting at-home COVID tests either online or not at an in-network pharmacy. And what these FAQs allow is plans and issuers can require an attestation from the individuals that the test was purchased for personal use, not for employment purposes, and has not been and will not be reimbursed by any other source and is not for resale. This, so this prevents people from buying a thousand at-home COVID-19 tests, getting reimbursed from their insurer, and then going out and selling them on the secondary market. Again, there are steps that insurers can take to prevent that from happening. As a balance to that, the FAQs are concerned with insurers making these fraud and abuse rules too stringent and too burdensome on individuals. So while insurers and plans are free to adopt these anti-fraud and anti-abuse rules, the rules cannot be unreasonable. They can't require individuals to, to submit multiple levels of documentation or go through multiple steps to be reimbursed without cost sharing for the cost of at-home COVID-19 tests. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. So that, that's really the substance of the guidance that was issued in January. I think the key takeaways are that plans and issuers must cover at-home COVID-19 tests without any cost sharing, regardless of whether the test is ordered by an attending healthcare provider or not. Plans and issuers should be considering whether they're going to adopt the safe harbor, weigh the benefits against the costs, and plans and issuers are not required to provide coverage without cost sharing if tests are for employment-related purposes. Again, return to work tests or weekly required testing by the employer. Um, so with that, that's, that's all I have, Andy, and I appreciate the time. DJ, thank you. So we got, we got a few questions, all that you know, very helpful and uh, appreciate you sharing it with us. Personally, very insightful to see too. Um, one of the comments or questions that we got that I've heard uh, elsewhere too, is that, hey, you know, when, our, our, when I've gone to a pharmacy to, to purchase one of these items or an employee has gone to purchase one of these items, they're having to pay out of pocket. They're not being um, advised of, you know, the potential for coverage there. Now, conceivably, is that because at least at that point, maybe this wasn't an option or that the entity has made a decision that they're not going to um, pursue this safe harbor direct pay uh, option? Is that right? So, so again, this is a relatively rule, new rule that just took effect January 15. So prior to January 15, health plans and health insurance issuers were not required to cover the cost of at-home COVID tests unless they were ordered by your doctor. I anticipate that, I don't know if there's going to be notification at the store or on Amazon, but plan documents may need to be amended to reflect this new change in the rules and SPDs and SMMs may need to be updated as well. Um, but that's something we would need to look at on an individualized basis to see what type of notifications are provided. Okay. And 
And for those who have insured plans, um, you know, certainly DJ, you're available to work with them as, as well as self-insured, but uh, I imagine that they should also be talking with their insurance carrier too about uh, coordinating and what the carrier's position is gonna be on these issues, right? Correct. And uh, it, frankly, the, the guidance was issued on January 10th and it took effect on January 15th. My assumption is that it, insurers are working to quickly get this up and running, but they may not have all the answers right now, but I would definitely suggest speaking, excuse me, speaking with the insurer to see how they're going to handle this. Okay. And, and I noticed on the, the prior slide, it, it uh, required a certification or attestation of, of certain things, including that it wasn't being used for employment purposes. And am I right that, uh, tell, tell me if I am or, or otherwise, but was that intended? So in a, an employer or you know a manager couldn't go purchase a bunch of tests to use um you know with respect to employees and and claim reimbursement for it or it's it's intended to cover that the ffcra was really aimed at diagnostic testing so if someone thinks they have covid they go out and they get a covid 19 test they can submit that reimbursement. The, the agencies have taken a different approach when that testing isn't diagnostic. In their view, I think testing could arguably always be diagnostic. When it's just required by your employer, a weekly test, a return to, to work test that you have to take as a condition of employment, the agencies are not requiring insurers to pay for those tests without imposing cost sharing. Okay, all right, so that, so in those situations you just mentioned then, that automatic, so to speak, reimbursement would not necessarily apply. There could be Correct. cost sharing. Okay. Correct. And, and the attestation is at the insurer or plan's discretion. They don't have to use it, but I would assume that a lot of them are going to use some okay. form of that. Great. Thankful. DJ, we'll have your contact information on at the end of the presentation, but thanks for joining us today, folks. If you have questions about this issue, DJ is a great resource. I work with them very regularly and encourage you to do the same. So thank you, DJ. Thanks, okay, uh, next up, it's my pleasure to welcome Shannon Knapp. Shannon is another associate who works here in our Syracuse office. Uh, and Shannon, among other things, uh, works within our uh, uh, data security uh, and compliance data privacy area here at the firm. And correct me if I'm not wrong, Shannon, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, I guess. So data, I, I think, let me get it right. National Data Privacy Day, it's Friday? Yes, yes, okay. it's Friday. All right, great. Um, so you, you've you been doing a bunch of outreach on, on this issue. And, and certainly I think everyone on, on our Zoom will appreciate, uh, if, if not have directly on their desk, uh, data privacy and cybersecurity issues. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Data Privacy Day is a great event that's been going on for a number of years now, um, internationally and nationally, as a way to increase uh, awareness about these important issues. And obviously, the data privacy world's a large world, and there's a lot of different compliance and other important issues. But today, I am going to concentrate on the importance of privacy policies for businesses to implement. Um, all of us probably are aware of what a privacy policy is. Oftentimes we probably just scroll right past them when we're online shopping or doing things on the internet without giving it a second thought. However, the importance and rele relevancy of privacy policies has substantially increased over the, at least the last five years or so and have become an integral part of uh, business compliance obligations and for businesses to implement. First off, with the increase of everyone's online presence, uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic, there is more attention than ever give, uh, about businesses' practices and their online collection of consumer information. Also, there has been a substantial change in the landscape concerning data privacy with the passing and implementation of substantive data privacy laws from the European Union's General Data Protection, GDPR, to the California Consumer Privacy Act. In addition, just last year, we saw other states following this trend, including Virginia and Colorado passing their own laws, and it's only a matter of time until New York follows suit. 
And with all of this, these new laws have resulted in increased compliance obligations for many businesses. And a privacy policy is one of the most important compliance and notice mechanisms for businesses to implement. So as way of a bit of background, there are two documents that you probably have seen on websites. And one is a terms of use and one is a privacy policy. And these documents are a bit different and serve different functions. Uh, terms of use, or they're sometimes called terms and conditions, terms of service, or something along those lines, is a binding contract that can be used to manage a uh, user's activities and expectations and to protect your businesses from legal issues. So this is more of your traditional contract, whereas a privacy policy serves more as a notice to consumers about how you will be using their personal information, what steps you have been taking to protect their information, how they can exercise their rights involving their information and other important information. Although both of these documents are very important, today I'm just concentrating on the privacy policy. And as I mentioned, there's all these new consumer privacy laws, and there's also ones that have been around much longer, such as GLBA for financial institutions or COPA for organizations that collect information about children. And all of these laws requiring certain disclosure and notices to be made readily available to consumers. And although there's no general federal law that requires privacy policies as of now, they're highly encouraged by the FTC and have become the standard feature of a legitimate commercial website. And it's become very evident when a website doesn't have a privacy policy and can be a red flag to some people. Privacy policies, unlike what a lot of people think, are not a one-size-fits-all document and really should be drafted specifically to comply with businesses' particular practices concerning personal data. Important information that should be included in privacy policies is what information is being collected, how it is being collected, such as are they filling in the information on the website by filling out some sort of application or contact form, or is it being automatically collected through Google Analytics or cookies or things along those lines? And then also how you're using this information, who you're disclosing it to and why you're disclosing it, as well as, well as any opt-out mechanisms from receiving emails or these practices is really important to include. And specifically, for example, under the California Consumer Privacy Act, even more information is, import, um, is required to be included, such as particular contact information for consumer rights requests, the ways in which Californians can make California residents can make these requests and much more specific disclosures about the type of information that is being collected. Also, it's important that privacy policies include the contact information for businesses so that consumers can easily reach the business app. Um, in addition, if you're subject to specific data privacy laws such as CCPA or GDPR, make sure you have mechanisms in place, like I mentioned earlier, to receive consumer requests and to follow the required timing requirements that many of these statutes have. For example, under the California Consumer Privacy Act, if after you receive a consumer request, you have to answer within 10 days confirming receipt and then follow more specific timing requirements thereafter. Also, if you already have a privacy policy in place, which is a great practice as I've been talking about, it's also important to update it at least annually. This ensures that the bus your business stays up to date on its compliance obligations, that the policy reflects any retention policy or standards that may have changed over the last year, and ensures the overall accuracy of the policy. The last thing your business needs is a policy that does not accurately reflect the practices of your business, as this can lead to a deceptive business practice action brought against you by the FTC. In addition, given the rapidly changing data privacy legal landscape, an annual review helps ensure that you're up to date on any new laws that may have been passed as they've been pa being passed so frequently over the past number of years. And also most importantly, regular updates promote transparency and keep consumers up to date on your practices, which is important for both a business and legal perspective. So overall, just kind of wrapping everything up, a privacy policy has kind of gone from a document that maybe few people paid attention to, to one that requires a lot of attention and, and is an important notice and compliance document that businesses, businesses should ensure they have implemented. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know, but that's what I had. Shannon, thank you very much for the overview. It's appreciated. Uh, 
it, just the other day, right, you and I were working together on um, a similar issue for a client um, who had a policy that needed to be updated. Uh, in, in my uh, experience dealing with handbooks and policy manuals, uh, this is an area that, um, you know, understandably may have been overlooked in the past, given that there's been, uh, A, so many developments in this particular area uh, and new requirements, but, but so many other requirements that uh, clients and friends of the firm are needing to keep tabs on. So I'll have your contact information uh, included at the end of the program here, Shannon. Uh, if folks have any questions on this area, uh, Shannon will be glad to work with you and respond to your, your inquiries and provide assistance. So thanks again, Shannon. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned there were some emerging issues um, Let's, let's cover that and just dive right into it here for the last few minutes. I know I got a lot of questions from folks about the masking mandate and the court ruling that you may have uh, heard about um, yesterday uh, and the news kind of breaking with that over, over the evening and this morning. Uh, so just moving along to the next slide, uh, I, I'll give you just a, a, a quick bit of background on the history here. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep track of all these things and the different requirements that have gone into effect that have been rescinded. Uh, but uh, uh, after a period of time where um, the masking had been, uh, the requirement had been uh, rescinded for those who were fully vaccinated, it was reimposed uh, at, the, at the early part of this year, following an announcement from the governor's office that masks would be required in all indoor places, regardless of vaccination status, unless that entity uh, decided to uh, impose a you know, vaccinated only entrance policy. Uh, that, that announcement was then translated by the State Department of Health into a commissioner's de uh, uh, determination and that was styled as a state regulation. Uh, that was published on the 13th of uh, January on the 22nd. Uh, in case you need it, there's a link there to the actual um, order. Um, you've probably seen it before. If you go to our, our blog, the New York Labor and Employment Law Report, you'll find an article on the subject and a link to the guidance. Um, not necessary right now for you to have that, but it's there if you do need it. Um, so again, that was a determination that was made that said, again, again the same thing as the governor announced that, hey, if, if um, um, all indoor public places um, need to uh, require persons to be masked, uh, that included employers, included other operations. There were some specific uh, differing guidance for different institutions like schools, like hospitals, um, but uh, that's what we've been operating under since. And of course, uh, that, that also implicated our requirements as employers under the HERO Act and our Infectious Disease Control Plan, uh, which did need to address the issue of masking and, and to the extent uh, there is available uh, state, federal, local requirements uh, in place uh, that govern masking as well as other issues that our plan would need to uh, address and incorporate those requirements. So now I'm uh, moving to the next slide and, and fast forwarding to yesterday, there was a decision issued uh, by a trial court. Uh, so the, the highest trial court, but a trial court uh, in, in New York State Supreme Court from Nassau County uh, that overturned um, that rule. It found it was unconstitutional uh, and that was an impermissible exercise of powers on the part of the agency. And, and it's a, not a lengthy decision, uh, uh, seven or eight pages, I think. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, direct to the point, uh, two, two things are notable. One, it doesn't make any you know, qualitative assessment over the, the merit of the masking mandate. It's expressly not intended to do that. It doesn't question the motives of those who created uh, the mandate. Uh, it, it readily admits that those motives were um, no doubt intended to be benevolent and in the best interest of New York, but ultimately it boils down to uh, the fact that th there was not a delegation uh, of powers to the administrative office, to the governor, to the, the State Department of Health to be able to make and impose such a requirement and to have it have the, the force and effect of law. Rather, uh, that power is vested with the state legislature. Uh, and since there was not a proper delegation of that, that authority, uh, this was not uh, an appropriate exercise of power on the state agency's part. 
uh, and thus the rule was, was uh, deemed unlawful. The challenge to this, this uh, regulation and the litigation was actually commenced by uh, parents of school-aged children. Uh, it's interesting to note though, the, the breadth of the ruling does not uh, on its face appear to be limited to just uh, the school setting and masking in the school setting. Now, as you may expect, there was a fairly swift response from state officials. Uh, I included, you know, again, this is another time where we go to Twitter, right, for the latest update on news and what's happening uh, rather than the news itself. Uh, there was a tweet from the Attorney General indicating uh, that they intend to challenge that. Indeed, they, there was a very prompt challenge um, to the Nassau County Court's ruling. Uh, and uh, as we speak, I, I checked just before I hopped on here, I hadn't seen any further developments on this, uh, but this could well be another one of those issues that's developing while we're all together on this webinar. Stay tuned today. Uh, this has been a, uh, a notice of appeal has been filed here, uh, and we may see some type of ruling from uh, the intermediate uh, appellate court area on this issue. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, the governor also uh, issued an announcement uh, responding to this uh, that you'll see on the next slide. Very, very brief announcement, but basically, hey, understand the ruling. We're doing everything we can to, to stop the spread, and we disagree with this ruling. Um, so you have support for an appeal from the governor's office, too, not unexpectedly, given that you know, the rule in the first place was brought by the governor's office. But I think it's important to take that uh, into consideration. All right. So. Uh, I'm sure you've got a number of questions. Uh, we do too. A and uh, a lot of them boil down to, okay, well, what, what do we do next? Uh, and uh, I, as you'll see on the, on the next slide, uh, I've tried to identify you know, a few things for you just according to your to-do list, all right? Well, again, I, I mentioned to you, this is an emerging issue happened late, as, late last night. Uh, there's an intention to appeal it, action's been taken to appeal it. And we could very well see action in the very near future on this. So continue to monitor this issue for further developments. Uh, again, you can check our blog, the New York Labor and Employment Law Report, where we will, we will push out these updates. And we also will, will then uh, publish those updates through our, our various social media accounts on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and et cetera. So uh, link with us or connect with us on those social media platforms too to stay updated. I think you have to take a... Let, let's assume, all right, uh, that, that the ruling um, applies statewide. Uh, and again, this is just for purposes of our discussion here, but let's assume that that ruling applies statewide and, and it applies across the board. So, so the, the rule and regulation is rescinded wholesale. Uh, well, you know, again, that does not necessarily um, tie an employer's hands um, in implementing such a masking rule in and of itself. Now that can carry with it um, certain obligations and there can be certain limitations in implementing such a rule. But in general, if it's a private sector employer, uh, it's able to set its, its own reasonable rules uh, as it sees fit. A and uh, again, in the public sector, there could be issues associated with implementing a rule like this. If you have a collective bargaining relationship, there could be bargaining obligation uh, with implementing a masking rule uh, outside of a, of a governmental mandate. But uh, again, I think it's just an important takeaway here to remember that uh, you likely still have a measure of control. Uh, and, and currently there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. I'm aware uh, uh, at least uh, secondhand that uh, state officials within the education department have uh, directed schools that there is an appeal pending and that uh, the expectation is that schools will continue to uh, are expected to continue to comply with the masking requirement. Uh, again, I've read stories that some districts are, are choosing not to, um, and some are keeping the masking requirements in place. Uh, but again, I think that emphasizes that there's a, a strong measure of uncertainty as to what the future may hold here. Um, so uh, my recommendation is let's be cautious, let's be careful. Uh, and given that this is a developing legal issue, it's important that you do speak with your legal counsel uh, that you, you do understand um, the implications of the ruling, how it may affect your particular operations, and what your options and strategies are moving forward, along with an appropriate assessment of risk along the way. But I think it's appropriate to give some thought. How, how do you, uh, at this point, want to respond, uh, if at all, to this issue? Um, again, get, if all the assumptions that I laid out for you are indeed uh, the case, 
um, what is your position going to be right now? And, and you know, there's any number of variables that you need to take into consideration, I would imagine. And uh, th there's no one answer to this. Again, it's going to depend on your organization, your customer base, uh, how much interaction there is uh, with others, uh, concerns about perception, uh, you name it, the list is long, but uh, I think it's appropriate now for you to consider this. Uh, again, monitor it. And then to the extent uh, you may have questions from your staff uh, or employees, from customers, from other stakeholders, how are you going to respond to those issues? Uh, I think having a message crafted and ready to go, uh, I think this is an appropriate uh, for those of you who, who are, are part of an administration, you need to, to raise this with um, folks uh, in other lines. I think it's an appropriate issue to bring to their attention so that everyone's aligned with your approach and how you intend to address this issue in the short term. Again, this, this exercise candidly may, may become academic um, very shortly here with a ruling from the, the appellate division that effectively stays uh, the Supreme Court's decision. I, I just don't know, we'll have to see, but I promise you we will report further on it, uh, but we at least wanted to give you this guidance uh, in the interim and for now. Uh, beyond that, to address your individualized circumstances, again, I encourage you to work with legal counsel. We are certainly available here at Bond to help. Feel free to reach out to your favorite Bond attorney or any of the presenters that were here today. Okay, folks, uh, that's what we have for you today. Uh, before I, I, I turn it over and, and we wrap up, there is just one more thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, that being uh, something we've reported on at length in OSHA's, the Vaxxer Test ETS. Uh, I checked the OSHA's website this morning just to see if there was anything new. Interestingly, they did publish a, a comment on their website indicating that they were withdrawing the Vaxxer Test ETS. Again, that was the one that the Supreme Court reinstated reinstituted the stay of enforcement on. So they are withdrawing that, that rule formally. But interestingly, OSHA indicated in this communication that they nevertheless intend to pursue more uh, permanent rulemaking when it comes to this particular issue and workplace safety dealing with COVID and pandemic response. So stay tuned on that. Uh, again, that's, that's not what I would say is an imminent issue that you need to, to keep on your radar screen, but it's one you definitely don't want to lose track on for larger employers. All right, thank you again. You'll see our contact information here. If you have any questions on these subjects, please reach out to us. We're here to help. Uh, hang in there in the meantime. We wish you all uh, be safe, be well, and we'll see you next week.